talk to us about digitization of U.S. herbarium. David, please, it's all yours. All right, thanks very much, Paula. Can everyone, uh, can I get a thumbs up that you can see my screen? Good, yeah. okay. So, um, my uh, co-authors are, are Jocelyn Pender and uh, James Macklin at Agriculture Canada and Rich uh, Rabler at uh, University of Michigan. And the question that we asked here is, um, how close did we get to the 2020 goal? And so what is the 2020 goal? The 2020 goal. And um, so I'll give you a bit of back background. Um, in 2004, there was a workshop in uh, East Lansing in Michigan and uh, Rich Rabler and James Macklin were in attendance among other folk. Um, and what they declared at that workshop is that um, let's set ourselves a goal in the grandest senses and make all botanical specimen information in the United States collections available online by 2020. So this is the goal. And the main message from that workshop um, are, are a number of items on how do we get there. Um, Reed Beeman, through personal communication, estimated an approximate uh, 95 million specimens in U.S. herbaria, and that estimate has been refined over the years, and in particular, the Index Herbariorum in its 2019 annual report estimated uh, in the neighborhood of 78.7 million specimens from U.S. herbaria. And at, at, uh, in 2004, it was thought that approximately 5 million or 5.2% roughly were thought to be digitized at some level, but not yet online. And this is long prior to the um, ADBC program or IDIG bio, so bear that in mind. Um, so they, a number of items were highlighted, a need for continued development of data standards, quality measures, uh, a need for more ability to share digitized data and georeferencing between and among collections, and a need to maximize efficiency by digitizing duplicate specimens once in theory and then sharing that data among institutions. So this was culminated in a report that appeared in Collection Forum in 2006. And uh, I'll let you uh, dig that one up um, to read through some of the details of that, that uh, report. And so here in a nutshell um, is the cartoon representation of the goal, where in 2004, we had roughly 5 million specimens digitized and that took approximately 30 years. Um, and the, the goal then is that let's get up to 78.7 .7 million by 2020. Um, so um, contrary to what Raj just presented, um, let's count all the things. So how do we get an answer to this particular question? And this is the bulk of our challenge for, the, um, for what we did this, this past summer, trying to come up with an answer. And so um, now we do have an IDIG bio aggregator in addition to GBIF, um, that IDIG bio emerged in roughly 2011. Um, so our assumption is, and a very naive assumption, it does not matter which aggregator we use to answer this question. And all data are equivalent and fully synchronized among and between them. Is that true? So here's what we did. Um, here's our recipe. We downloaded a data set from GBIF and another from IDIG Bio in July of 2020. And this was in preparation for a presentation that uh, Rich gave to the Botanical Society of America annual conference. And I did it again about a week and a half ago um, in preparation for, uh, for uh, the Tadwig meetings. And so um, perhaps there's an opportunity there to get uh, some kind of notion of progress, you know, what happened in July versus what happened in October. And some way to equate these two giant data sets using what? <laughs> That's the question. What do we use to equate these data sets? Um, and so this is a very challenging problem, but let's just download the data first and see what we can do with it. So this is what we challenged ourselves with in July. And so um, using a bit of um, dangerous knowledge of Scala and Apache Spark, um, we downloaded both data sets from GBIF and from IDIG Bio, and then filtered them through as best we possibly could and put our, our code on GitHub. And so on GBIF, um, it was very nicely presented to us, roughly 870 published data sets from the US, um, which we could then grab and filter um, by the kingdom, plantae, chromista, and fungi. And then in 2020, in July, that resulted in 25.6 million records, or roughly 216 data sets. 
In iDigBio, the story is a little bit more challenging in the sense there's no list of US-based publishers. There's a breadth of a whole bunch of publishers throughout the world that have whose data appear in iDigBio. And so what we had to do is go through all what they call record sets and find all US-based publishers. And then again, filter by plantae, chromista, and fungi. And interestingly, in July of 2020, we get more, 30.8 million records across 526 or 525 record sets. Um, so, you know, right away, there's an interesting kind of question. Why is it that there are such, there's such a dramatic difference between these two record sets or data sets as they may be called. And this harkens back to a number of papers that have been produced over the years. Here's one in particular about fish data, uh, comparing biodiversity databases, uh, GBIF, OBIS, IDIGBio, FishNet, FishBase, and the authors here did a whole uh, breadth of a survey across all these different resources. And lo and behold, they found some dramatic differences. And this has implications for doing things like species distribution modeling. Um, and so we ought to be very mindful of um, what our community is doing uh, in being able to share our records from one aggregator to another. A naive user might take one or the other at exclusion and then realize that they might have uh, come up with some erroneous conclusions. And so here, as a summary, uh, in July of 2020, 32.8 million records from IDIG Bio, uh, comparable, but much less number in GBIF. In October, 2020, 35 and a half million records in IDIG Bio, 26.8 million from GBIF. Um, and you would think in the time of COVID um, that we might get quite a dramatic increase of those numbers or not, depending on what may have happened in those, each of those institutions. Um, so it's worth bearing in mind that there might be some kind of signal about the whole uh, COVID uh, epidemic and in, in, in what these numbers really represent. So anyway, roughly six and a half, four to five to six million new records a year in, in either aggregator. And this is reflected in some of the very nice graphics that GPIF produces. Uh, and these are the US-based uh, herbaria uh, and plant records. Uh, again, approximately 5 million record, new records a year. So um, let's also assess you know, our progress against Index Herbariorum's annual report um, and, and trying to equate these data sets. I haven't touched on that. How do you do that? How do you equate these data sets? And so here I'm using the institution code, collection code, catalog number triplet, because I really haven't got another handle to get a notion of equation between these two. Data sets are very different from one or the other. And so let's just use the naive triplet. Um, the estimate from Index Herbariorum, 78.7 million records. How well did we do? Well, you can see here that approximately half are not yet available in GBIF and IDIG Bio. And there's uh, some significant overlap between these two data sets, 18.8 million records that are roughly equivalent across these two data sets, but there's still a significant residual where there's uniqueness in either one. So some problems faced along the way. Well, first of all, as uh, Rich discovered in going through all these data sets is that there's a hemihominy or classification issue. Um, plant records purported to be uh, plants, but are actually animals because they, the, the full hierarchy had not been provided by the publishers. And so as a result, the records have been pigeonholed into the wrong kingdom. So that needs to be contended with. And there's an opportunity there in making better use of botanical duplicates, but they're buried in these numbers as well. There are, are undoubtedly quite a number of botanical duplicates. And I draw your attention to the work that um, Nikki, Nilsen, Nikki Nicholson has been doing in this space. And also that GBIF in uh, July of this year, after we downloaded her data sets, have implemented some new clustering features, um, which should bring to bear what's happening here in these, in these estimates. And so here, again, another cartoon representation of what we've got. We are roughly half, approximately, um, in that, um, to, uh, that uh, 2004 goal um, in where we, we would like to have been at this time. And so if we project that to the future at roughly 5 million records a year, we are projecting roughly around 2028 where we might get up to 78.7 million. And I put this in yellow here as a cautionary note because there's a whole suite of implications and questions here about whether or not we can actually get there, especially when we think of the long tail of herbaria. And so looking at it at an institutional level, here are the institution codes um, blasted out here on a one-to-one -one line. Um, that one-to-one -one line is the parity between these two aggregators. On the upper part, on the upper left of that graph are going to be all the institution codes that are sharing more records to IDIGBio than they are to GBIF and vice versa on the, on the lower part of that graph. And you can see some quite dramatic differences here. Um, 
and if you look at the 2020 numbers, um, there has been some shifts um, from at those within those three intervening months with communications with folk at GBIF who have found those record sets and then been able to harvest some of them uh, in GBIF. And so there's already been a response on the, on the part of the GBIF community. And yet there's some, a few issues here that stand out. Um, so for example, the Rocky Mountain Herbarium at the University of Wyoming um, is undergoing um, a, a republishing of its data and is in the, in the midst of um, a bit of a glitch, if you will. And so that's that mauve sort of um, color way down at the bottom left. Um, it will jump up very soon as, I, as, I'm, as I'm aware. And some other potential glitches here, like the gray herbarium on Harvard University, who's, who's jumped up um, in providing more records to IDIG Bio, but I think this may be more of a technical issue in, in the progression and how its data have been published. That might, again, might've been a glitch when or historically those data have already been provided. So anyway, the message here is that there are shifts from one month to the next. And if you look at MIDS, um, MIDS is a wonderful new initiative um, being put out by ICEDIG, the minimal information for digital specimens, coverages across herbarium codes. And this is the data for October, 2020. You can see immediately here um, that there are quite dramatic differences between one aggregator to another. So if you look at nothing but the catalog number or whether or not it has an image, it seems that you know on the bottom left here, if you are an herbarium, you either provide images or you don't um, across uh, your institution. So there's some interesting patterns there. And the, another level of MIDS would include other uh, Darwin core terms as a, as a measure of progress. So scientific name ID, for example, very rarely provided. Scientific name on the other hand, almost always provided. And some preparations, you know, what was done in order to prepare those specimens to, to publish them to the world, minimally provided across institutions. And again, at a higher other levels of MIDS, you know, whether it has coordinates, whether it has a recorded by or verbatim elevation, quite a, uh, some differences among these aggregators, but uh, some overall patterns here that um, are really quite interesting. And again, another higher level of MIDS identified by, um, interestingly, not provided as frequently as it probably could be or should be within our community. So uh, what we did discover is that there are really subtle imperceptible shifts in coverage from July 2020 to October 2020. Not surprising, but you would have anticipated perhaps that the, in these months of COVID, um, there was a whole lot of digitization and improving of data, but undetectable in either GBIF or IDIG bio. So some reflections. Progress has benefited greatly from the ADBC and thematic collection network program. And likewise, Symbiota also coming online, producing over 700 collections, 440 million worth of records. Um, and those can need to be wired up a little bit more effectively to GBIF. And so I, we also need to have more machine readable data, not just images and barcode. And this is where MIDS might come into play as a, as a, as a means of assessing our progress in terms of what kinds of data are being provided. And I think another message worth keeping in mind is that we should never say digitization is complete. You know, we've, we've matured enough within our community to realize that there will always be new uh, kinds of data to connect into this knowledge graph and MIDS may help refocus our efforts in measuring progress a bit more effectively. So some challenges, not all data are publicly available. The aggregator view is inconsistent. Um, maybe the digital specimen objects and extended specimen network will help in coming up with some kind of record level identifiers that are more effective than this triplet. Um, it bears to, um, um, we'll have to bear that in mind. Uh, digital specimen objects and extended specimen uh, will be talked about tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. And we need a robust annotation mechanism to push data back to providers and improve these data as a, as a community. Digitization is expensive. And we, of course, we need new additional funding opportunities to push that up as high as we possibly can. What do we need? Real-time synchronization across and between all aggregators. We're not there yet. We need a global infrastructure. It's sustainable and perhaps reliant upon a centralized system, not a distributed system. That's worth some discussion. More development on MIDS for collaborators uh, and its particular developers to make use of this and metrics that are responsive to individuals, collections, institutions, um, so that we can give credit for effort. And it's an unquivocal, unquiv unequivocal message for decision makers. More high throughput imaging and image processing systems. We have great new advances in that front. More is needed. And we have to take advantage of duplicate specimens um, more effectively than it was done, to the done in the past. 
uh, and make use of Exacate to maximize our efficiencies. So with that, I will thank the National Science Foundation for funding the 2004 workshop, creating the whole ADBC program in the first place, GBIF and IDBio for making their data available, and Ed Gilbert and Andy Miller, who were uh, key um, um, communicators at the very uh, onset of our project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for your talk. We have a couple of minutes for questions left. There are some questions that have been uh, posted uh, in the chat. So one of them is, how many of the data sets, record sets across IDBi or GBIF were sourced from the same location? And how many of these were sourced from the same version of these regional data sets? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, we, we've taken a very um, gestalt sort of approach, if you will. In, in, and of course, one of the challenges is that a lot of data sets include records from multiple institutions. Um, and so um, in addition to just not knowing about location with any great deal of precision, there's also a, a challenge in knowing precisely where records have come from in the institutional sense, not in a geographic sense. So. Um, that's not a very effective answer, <laughs> but I hope you appreciate the challenge in trying to do this at a whole aggregator level. Thank you. So we have, uh, I'll pass you the next, uh, the next question uh, is probably for you and for the floor. What do we do with the high hanging fruit once we've deal we've dealt with the with the easiest half of the specimens, which would be the approaches, which are the suggestions on how do we prioritize? It's a good question. I mean, I, I've, um, I mentioned in my talk that I think it's a bit, we, you know, our community has matured over the years. It's not enough just to digitize and say we're done. Um, that's not the quite message we want to send to the community, nor is it the right message to send to administrators or funding agencies. The question has to do with the connectivity now among individual data points and how effectively we do that. And so we'll, we'll look to Rod and hopefully we'll have some answers on how best to measure progress on that front. Um, so I, there's no clear cut answer here. Um, um, I, I think underpinning it all, there must of course be real questions of science. And then the next is can you provide a reason why IDIC by on GBIF numbers would be different other than the cases where one source has zero records? Um, I, I think it's more of a cultural reason more than it is a technical one. Uh, in historically speaking, um, as far as I understand with communications with Rich and others, um, there, there was uh, the influx of new record sets um, into the whole IDIC bio um, infrastructure um, was often done um, without an eye to GBIF. Um, and so there was a bit of naivety uh, at, at the launch of many of those uh, TCM projects in publishing out the data, thinking that um, IDIGBIO will be the end product and the resting place for those data um, without necessarily thinking of the, the global context. And I think um, there's been a real good strong push now to ensure that some of those record sets that are on IDIGBIO in isolation will eventually appear on GBIF and, and over the next few months, I'm anxious to see some of that happen. Thank you. I, I have to tell you, if you're not monitoring the document that there is a lot of activity in there, uh, I invite everyone to, to look at the, at the questions and comments that people are, are gathering there. So one of the questions that I, I skipped in the middle is why does an occurrence ID work to disambiguate the different data sets? Uh, that, that's, that's a question that of course the folk at GBIF and IDIGBIO can both answer. Um, the real reason is again uh, a, a cultural reason more than it is a technical one. Um, there are uh, it is so inconsistent among the two uh, aggregators that it is virtually unusable to be used in that context. I think it would be interesting to verify whether or not, you know, how much a comparison can we do with a current ID. But the first initial passes of us trying to do this comparison was that um, it was really, really abysmal. Um, and we would hope that a current ID can be used in that context, but more often than not, 
they are not UUIDs or any kind of universal identifier. They are integer based. Okay, I'm trying. I'm trying to to swim uh, uh, between the questions because people are typing on top of what they already typed. Um, um, so someone asks here: Has digitization led to more accurate estimates of the number of specimens or collection objects in herbaria? That's a very good question. Um, I don't, I don't know how best to approach that one. I guess we'd have to figure out what what does accurate mean. Do do we have an ability to detect error? Um, so that's quite a loaded question, and I'm afraid I don't have an answer off the top of my head to try and sort that one out. You would hope that there are patterns there, that there have been improvements in data over time, and those three months that we did this, July to October, really insufficient in trying to get a rate of progress. But again, this gets back to the question of how do we measure progress? Okay, I think we answer most of the concrete questions and there is a lot of discussion going on that maybe we can um, go back to during the discussion time. 